uh, Rasul Berry here, excited to be among you again uh, at Courageous Conversations. And that statement, I'm spiritual but not religious. Maybe you've heard it said to you, but what does it actually mean? Can you be one without the other? Oftentimes, they were thought to be synonymous, but they seem to have mean, become to mean two distinct things. So we're going to talk about this aspect of being spiritual and being religious and really kind of starting it off with this sense of definitions. Recently, the Pew uh, Research Group, they have shown that this group is growing. Uh, in just the last 10 years, it's gone from 16% of the US population who identifies as spiritual but not religious to 29%. So this is an increasingly growing group. And i uh, love to kick it off. Maybe we'll start to my right of just, let's start first by how do you define spiritual and how do you define religious? I would define spiritual as having a connection or relationship or an experience with God. Um, like this deep abiding uh, internal knowledge that God exists and he's a part of my life and I'm connected to him. Uh, with religion, I would define it as uh, or someone who is religious, who practices and holds to formative habits and beliefs that uh, are a way of worship to whoever I think God may be. Um, and so I would also say that those practices and beliefs are connected and instituted by the divinity, by God, and many times facilitated by leaders that he himself appoints. All right, excellent, thorough uh, start to that convo. BJ, what do you, what do you think? It's a great question. Um, I think specifically as it relates to defining the idea of spirituality versus religion, I, you know, I, I think a lot about my upbringing and I think about being in church um, and I think about going even when I didn't want to go. And I remember going to sleep in the back and, and looking over and feeling something like biting my arm. I'm like, what's this biting my arm? And it's my mama pinching my arm, right? <laughs> and so when I think about um, religion, I think about the habits, the routines, the patterns um, that adults are performing, older people are involved in. And, you know, sometimes they're doing things that I don't specifically understand, but I'm just kind of forced to be there. And I, I think when you think about um, spirituality, spirituality feels more like what you do and what you are and something that you have decided. And it is not being governed or facilitated by something you don't understand. It's your own understanding. Um, and I think that's essentially where we are right now is that people are seeking a sense of faith that's based off of their understanding of faith, not something that's being facilitated outside of themselves. Got it. And uh, Dr. Brianna Parker, I know that you work a lot with millennials and thinking about uh, younger generations who tend to skew more toward identifying this way. What do, what do you think they're saying and how are they understanding it? And how do you understand those distinctions? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I think there are a couple of things that are happening. I think that we have to remember that definitions evolve, devolve, all those things kind of change. Uh, Dr. Linda A. Mercandante would tell us that uh, because culture and religion and national identity change in different times and in, in eras in our um, in this country, the definitions would change as well. And so uh, we talked about last year, uh, I appreciate Pew's research, but you know, when we did State of the Black Church study, we were able to learn um, <laughs> that identity is an issue right now with black church people and black people of faith because there's some anxiety around just blanket, blanketly identifying as Christian, right? What does that mean? Does that mean I'm the kind of Christian that wears a red MAGA hat? Does that mean I'm the kind of Christian that locks children up in cages and I think that's okay? Like what kind of Christian? And I think saying you're religious right now creates the same type of anxiety. If I say I'm religious, what does that actually mean to society? More than I really hate religion, right? Because I think when we think about it just in general, we assume some people are saying, I like a lawless situation, I like a liberating situation, and other people are signing up for uh, restriction, right, and robotic type um, expressions. And I don't think that's what it really means, um, because actually, 
religion and spirituality both share four common beliefs, Linda, what Dr. Mercandante would say, and that's belief, behavioral expectations, rituals, and desire. And it's just all depending on how you define that, where you will put yourself. But most times, if we don't want to identify with something that's extremely um, difficult and maybe too conservative sometimes or maybe too Republican sometimes or maybe too Trump sometimes, you know, whatever it is that creates anxiety, we would rather say spiritual. But I'm starting to feel like there's a really blurred line and we can't even track what's happening over time because these things change as a social construct. There it is, uh, so much. And I know, uh, Andrew, you, you live in New York City, like I do, and this is uh, definitely a place where I see that framework or, you know, being uh, expressed quite a bit. What, what's kind of your take on spiritual religious? Yeah, I really love the question. Um, spirituality or being spiritual, I would define at the most basic level um, as belief and engagement in, in non-empirical realities, right? Belief in stuff like beauty, truth, goodness, love, stuff you can't screen record or videotape necessarily, that these aren't just fancy words for neurochemical reactions, but we believe this stuff actually exists to some degree. Whereas religion, um, for me, evokes something slightly different. I, I tend to think of religion in terms of uh, what gives one a sense of solitude and solidarity and the sacred that undergirds that what we do when we're alone to experience quiet time and some kind of transcendence, what the source of uh, understanding is that connects us together, that creates a sense of belonging, uh, that for me creates a slightly more definite sense that brings us to religion that's distinct from spirituality, even though they're kind of a Venn diagram, I feel like. Okay. Get your thesauruses out, ladies and gentlemen. We're we, <laughs> we going in deep now. Uh, did you just say diffident? A, a, def, a definite, definite sort of. Definite, okay, yeah. all right, got it, got it. So let's, I just want to keep up, because you know, we got Princeton, <laughs> we got doctors over here, I just want to make sure we keep it up. So let me, let's, let's like bring this down to like the local level. Would you identify as spiritual, religious, or both? I, I would say both. I, I think there's a deep spirituality within uh, Christian traditions that you find in the Psalms. I'm, I'm, um, Southern and Baptist, not denominational, but in, in the black Baptist sense. Uh, so stuff like hymn lining, like you find that rich thread of spirituality in the midst of Christian religious traditions. This man can preach. I, I got a chance to go to his church. You should check it out. Double love experience. Thank you so much. All right. So how about y'all? Religious, spiritual, both? Where you at? I would say I'm both. Uh, that my experience of God, my relationship with God, this deep sense of connectivity, this way of being and worship is fostered by the, the habits and beliefs that I enter into. But I don't enter into those out of obligation or because I think that they themselves are salvific. Um, or that they make me a better person if somehow I'm going through a season and I don't do those, but I do it at a place of beauty and love for the Lord. So I see them going together and fueling one another in my relationship with the Lord. That's, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, when I think about how do I answer the question, am I spiritual, am I religion? I think that I'm just now getting to a place of sober spirituality. And this is what I mean. Um, when I came to faith, I came to faith out the hood, out the streets, and I didn't know, all I knew was you put this on and it can protect you from danger. Right. So, you, you know, vampire movies, you put your little cross on and it's like going to keep you safe from the evil. And so, you know, growing up, I looked at religion as a way to protect me from some of the vices from life, from steep consequences, um, from dying. Like I looked at religion like that. And when I came to faith, I came to faith in such a supernatural way that it radically shifted not just me, but everyone around me, right? So it was like, man, now I'm, I'm seeing the spirit. Like I have this encounter where I see the presence of love beaming down on me, and I'm like, what is this, right? But along the journey, I started getting tangled up um, in what we would call evangelicalism, um, kind of this structure of knowledge and Things and I, and I just watched my faith get tangled up in religion. And I say that because not to villainize 
any type of denomination or any type of subculture or any type of attempt to try to bring order to, you know, faith or religion. I say that because when I look back at it, I had less joy. I had less love. I had less mental clarity. I did not feel more, just as free as I was when I first believed. And when it really counted, when I needed to become an advocate for justice, when I needed to look out for the oppressed, I was torn because I was standing in the middle of a religious institution that said, no, that ain't an issue because our political party didn't make it an issue, right? Or that ain't an issue because that's CRT or that's wokeism. And I'm like, damn, I don't know what to do now, right? Why are my hands tied and I'm supposed to be walking with, you know, my creator? And so I, I think that the, the more I'm realizing where I am right now, I've had to deconstruct a lot of the things that killed joy, hope, peace, love, and a desire to see human flourishing for all people regardless of religion, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of background. And I, I think that now where I'm at is I'm at a sober place where a lot of the principles and values of just like, man, I want to see my fellow man flourish, not because they believe a certain doctrine. I want to see my fellow man flourish because God loved me and he loves them. And out of that is where my faith in my belief now has action in the world. And so I think that you know, where I look at it, I'm detangling a lot of the things that, again, it's not a specific thing or denomination, but anything that kills hope, peace, joy, and love out of my life. And you, you know, you're describing a way in which sometimes religiosity can inhibit spirituality, right? So, you know, Dr. Parker, you mentioned, you know, seeing maybe we need to look at these terms more clearly and what people mean. So, one, how do you uh, even kind of self-identify and then kind of just bounce off of maybe what you've heard so far? So I would be really okay being seen as either one, honestly. Okay. I know, right? It's off brand. Um, I'm okay with being religious because I'm not worshiping, to be religious is not to worship a religion, right? It is to participate in those practices and beliefs and have those expectations. And so that does not take away the move of the Holy Spirit for me. That does not take away me being open to whatever God is speaking in addition to what I am reading in the text. You know, that doesn't take any of those things away from me. Like, you know, but like BJ saying, like, I never met a Jesus freak that I thought was like super loving. So I don't want to be a Jesus freak, but I want to be like sold out. Like, I want to be that kind. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to be like sold out. Ugh. I want to be like sold out. You know, it, see, it's just like different. See, you see, just, just the tone. You guys understand the difference in the I'm sold out versus sold out. You see? So I, I'm okay. Like, neither one of those take away from God, the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, um, how I walk out, shout out, speak in tongues, the Holy Ghost, you know, because when we're talking and we're trying to be like eloquent, it's the Holy Spirit. But you, you know, when you're in church, it's like, thank you, Holy Ghost. You know what I mean? So I'm okay with, with all of it and, and neither one of them, right, take away from that. If I was on a panel where I thought I was among people who would not understand that, I would explain to them why, I, why I'm spiritual, right, in addition to being religious. But I think it's just because we have these words that have evolved and devolved so much over time. And, you know, the tension in where we are in society doesn't really allow us to maybe even sometimes honestly talk about things like we don't want to be, if we're honest, like white evangelicals. That's right. But most black people are evangelical, right. fundamentally. And what we believe. We can't say that no more. Child, I'm going to be canceled so quickly. And then I'm going to be loved by another group of people like, oh, gosh, why have we not been giving Black Millennial Cafe funding? You know what I mean? Like, you know, to, right? right? So, you know, it, it gets tricky. But I think because we don't really have good, stable definitions, it's our responsibility. When we put out content, and I'm sure there are a lot of content creators here and among me, and uh, you know, Lisa Fields does it really well. I think the responsibility of putting out content is either to translate where people are 
right? So that people who have not understood them or had the opportunity to hear them can. Or it is to transform people, what they think, where they are. I think we have to do some transforming. Like we have to create some stable definitions. We have to really talk about what it means to be religious versus spiritual. And you only do that, of course, the researcher and me, by translating where people are, where they're feeling, and why they're not able to most honestly, fundamentally identify with whatever they think is true. And it's the all the stuff happening in society, all the anxiety around being canceled in this life. And so I think we have to translate for some people or translate for ourselves so that we can transform by creating definitions that people can honor and kind of get on the same page. Like if I met somebody and they told me today, um, you know, I'm, I'm attracted to you, I'm interested in you, but I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. You know, I don't know that I'm going to sit around and, you know, see what they mean by that. <laughs> because you can spiritually worship trees, I can worship party nails, I can worship bundles and braids, you know what I mean? Like you can really like make, a, you can be a believer of a lot of things. That's why those definitions are tricky, right? You can have behavioral expectations for other believers. You can desire right. to be closer, you know what I mean? To, so that's all tricky, but I don't know until we actually transform people by creating real definitions. Yeah. I don't think we can ever have these conversations and turn away from someone okay. quickly and assume we know what they mean. Got it. All right, so, so let's kind of drill in a little bit more on that. I um, believe this was uh, some of the research that Barna kind of pulled out that... Uh, uh, some of it. I mixed it together. Not, not this particular quote I'm pulling out, but that's coming. I got one just for you, because I know Black Millennial Cafe was very much... You were the much, lead researcher. I was. Don't yes, worry about yes. it. <laughs> so in, in this other piece, they said, all right, so just a little bit, learn a little bit more about these folks that say spiritual but not religious, uh, they write here, they're just as likely to believe that God represents a state of higher consciousness that a person may reach than an all-powerful, all-knowing, perfect creator of the universe who rules the world today. And it mentions, for context, only one in 10 American adults believe the former, that all this kind of higher consciousness is God itself. And six out of 10 believe the latter. So there's a higher sense in which those who identify according to this research. <laughs> but it was not about black people. I no, want to no, make no, it no. clear. I'll, so the numbers are very different when we talked about okay, black people. Okay. So in general, this is where I'm going with mm -hmm. it. I'm not so much about that particular point, but the specific idea of the squishiness that can emerge, right? When that some people are attracted to, mm -hmm. to get away from doctrine or what they might call dogma, to get into a space where it's like more amorphous and it's kind of ambiguous. I'm curious for you, Andrew, as a pastor, um, how do you think about the role of the church in that reality and the fact that there's growing sense of ambiguity or vagueness about what people mean by who God is or what, and that might lean itself toward this identification of spiritual as opposed to maybe the doctrines of the church you know, as, as such? Yeah, I think it's a really great question. Um, as, as a uh, happy co-pastor, I, I want to note that I, I press alongside yes. um, uh, Dr. Gabby Kutcher-Wilkes. What, what I think is the front door that we've often found that I think a lot of congregations find um, is the life cycle. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, when it's time uh, for the babies that are born to be blessed or baptized, when it's time for somebody to be married, when it's time to do a funeral, uh, when it's time to have somebody stand beside your hospital bed, those are still existential moments where people tend to look for somebody who's credible for, from a religious institution. And when that kind of work of deep belonging is done with care, with compassion, and a spirit of curiosity instead of deep assumption, we find that's when you can have some of the richest ministry moments that acknowledge some of the trauma, but can hopefully provide with the Spirit's help a different kind of experience. Okay, so that's people are still yearning for that sense of just meaning of uh, interpreting yeah. those major moments of life, right? You know, other opportunities to, as Dr. Parker mentioned, is kind of help people with the definitions. You know, where do you see that take place so that there can be that kind of sobering reality of spirituality that you mentioned? I think that <clears throat> much of our definition is something that um, we have observed or we're absorbing. And, you know, this is why people say, well, what religion is right? Because wherever you're born is the religion, right? 
And I think what we're really getting at is that we are a product of our environment or we will receive, um, we will observe health based off of what we see and how we experience others. And I'll never forget um, a specific theologian said this. He said, the greatest apologetic is the apologetic of love. So I think that one of the great opportunities we have is not what we tell people, it's how we love them, right? It's not when we have a five point, you know, doctrinal understanding, it's how compassionate we are when they're broken. This is the reason why I have such a problem with the way people act online um, towards people who are hurting, grieving. Um, um, when people have massive moments in the, you know, believers, because we, I don't want to say there's not a denomination, when Christians or people of faith are responding and they show themselves to be very callous, unconcerned, um, unmoved by the pain of others, what they don't recognize is that is the witness that you are giving. That's what you're saying God is like. That's what you're saying community is like. And so I think one opportunity we have is simply by, that's why it's called koinonia, coming together and showing deep compassion, love, empathy for one another, and then you allow people to belong before they have to believe, right? So they don't have to, you know, because again, you're arguing with someone who is thinking about their, they're moving out of their feelings, not out of facts. And this is why when you try to present facts, they just, it just doesn't move them. So, let, me, let me just double click on that. When you said oftentimes people are moving out of feelings instead of facts. Yes. Is that what you mean by the type of apologetic of love That's that exactly responds? what I mean. That's ex exactly what I mean is that we have moved to a society that is no longer based off of fact. Case in point, hypothetically, a group of people hypothetically um, rushed a building in Washington, hypothetically. Not hypothetically. Right? <laughs> and they tried to take over and to overturn an election. Right. We're debating whether or not a crime occurred on something that is in the law books. We're not talking about something that you dreamed up. We're talking about something that you will go to, try that now. What's today's day? <laughs> Whatever today's date is. You go try it now. Do the exact same thing while you go to jail, right? Do not pass go. Jude do not collect $200. You're not personally responsible for anyone who tries to overthrow the government. Right? Or I just got to put the disclaimer. <laughs> that is, hypothetically, you know, we're not responsible. Don't, don't run out in them streets and say, Jude 3 told me to do that. Right? <laughs> but all that to say, facts no longer matter. It's feelings. And the way God has set up life for us as believers is that we don't just do things by word, we do them by deed. And so our obedience of love shows people what we mean when we say certain doctrines. And this is one of the most critical things I think we can do to welcome people in. It's by having kind, loving relationships. Now think about how that changes the way we operate. So now you don't go so hard on said policy, said doctrine, said thing, even though you can have a clarity about what you believe, you go harder on the things that display um, sympathy, empathy, consideration for others. Yeah. And you do so by being meeting together consistently, and it's how we treat one another. Don't forget this, though. I'm, go ahead. I don't want us to forget the fact I think that's where we've been. I, I remember making the pivot away from like fact and always treat, teaching doctrine and talking about love and community. Don't forget we've seen a resurgence of the opposite in black Hebrew Israelites. Like it is about fact. People are attracted to the fact that there is fact. They are building community, but it's community around facts. They're not trying to come by your bedside. They're not teaching you love. They're not coming to your house. No major pastoral care. You do it on your own. I'm going to teach you how. It's like YouTube how-to videos, you know, almost kind of thing. But there is still a very strong attraction of facts. So I think sometimes Christians and pastors want to display, more, they want to present more spiritual, right, than religious so that it draws people in why he, black Hebrew Israelites are presenting as very religious and they are sweeping black men sure. and black Christian men, you know. So 
so I don't want us to think that there is a formula to attracting people with religious versus spiritual. I do think there is something about the authenticity behind either one that people are attracted to because I think that it's very dogmatic, right? But people are attracted because it is honest and authentic to who the people who are bringing it are. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it is that the fact and the truth fuels the love. And so that we bring people into the koinonia, into the community to be able to discover the vastness of what this religion is. Because you have to give people a beautiful vision for why I shouldn't show up online the way that I am. That why I need to care for someone even though I disagree with them. And that formation, that who I am trying to be comes from the truth and is shown through the love and doing. And I think we get into hard places when that love, which is, um, is so welcoming, can be disconnected from the vision and truth that we have that fuels it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it kind of reminds me of, uh, shout out to Dr. Carl Ellis, who you know kind of coined this idea of epistemological concerns and ethical concerns, right? The epistemological is the fact, like the, what this scripture teaches about the nature of who God is, who Jesus is, and the ethical, how we actually live that out. And essentially what I'm hearing is that in these last and evil days, we need to turn the volume up on both. You know what I mean? Like they, like we need space. So I'm, one of the things that I'm curious about, some of the research. I really like when you say last and evil days. It just feels very strongly black church. Yes, uh, that's what I was going for. I Speaking of the there. black church, right. um, there was some great research done, trends in the black church, uh, a few um, years ago by uh, a lead no, that, research that, partner. Not that long ago, though. Okay. <laughs> yes, the research is still fresh. Um, one thing that it, I noticed that really stuck out to me, and a lot of these, you know, stats that you see, you know, the amount of people who identify as Christian going down, the amount of people who attend church or pray regularly going down. But there was this one specific um, note that it said pastors of black churches are the most, most important leaders within the black community. That was a statement that was asked in 1996. 63% of the black community said yes, they are the most important uh, leaders within the black church in 1996. In 2020, that number increased to 69%. More people said that, you know, I see you nodding, and that stuck out to me because that's kind of a reversing of a trend. What do you think that's about, and how does that maybe inform some of this conversation? So as much as I joke, this stuff is so important to us because Generation Z believed it higher than anyone else. Like they were like riding really hard. Um, and I think it means a couple of things. I think it means, uh, you know, we searched all over, <laughs> couldn't find no, <laughs> couldn't find no leading authority we could trust better. Let's not pretend like we haven't searched all over, hello? Like we've seen people trying to find new leaders in our community and we keep coming back to the black church. Also know that we did this research at the time when everyone was rioting and protesting because they'd killed George Floyd in the middle of the street while he was calling his mama's name out. And so this was not a time where people had to remember or think about whether or not black pastors were uh, keeping the, holding the kind of authority we needed. They were watching it happen. So it says that there is something about black churches and black pastors today thinking that there is a certain level of humility by not saying where they are, what they believe, and standing out there and walking the walk and talking the talk. That's what changes in this moment, that they actually got to not wonder what would happen if George Floyd died and there's a pandemic going on. Do you still get out there? They were able to see it. So I think that says that black people of faith and black community, because the data was on community as well, have watched black pastors walk it out after hearing them for so long talk it out. Mm. Don't forget when they were talking it out, black millennials were kind of pre-Mike Brown. We were saying, you know, we, sh we have overcome. Remember, we, we, believe, we don't want to remember this no more. Mm. We believed we had, over, hit a place, right. we had hit a place of equality. That's and that we were our counterparts equals. And our parents were trying to tell us, no, sugar, you ain't made it. There's still a difference. Like, who, now, now y'all both walk in and do it and see what's gonna happen. And we didn't wanna believe it because black millennials, millennials are the most edu educated or degreed generation the country has ever seen. So we thought we had made some type of, there was equity, right, with equality. And that wasn't true. Mike Brown happens, all of a sudden, we're like, oh yeah, we should go burn this country down. 
And then our parents were like, no, 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 don't be so woke. Take a little nap every now and then. You know, don't be an insomniac. We were like, no, this is what we got to do. And it was like, but six months ago, y'all said we were equal. So we have to remember all the stuff that's happened. Like, millennials have had to go away and come back and make some new decisions. And it's what we've seen when times were hard that has made us believe in the black pastor as an authority and the black church as an institution. That's why when Andrew is saying to us, you know what I mean, like people are still coming when they want to be baptized, buried, or married, it's because we can't go nowhere else. We don't know who else loves us and will fight for us. And Amen. And Andrew, I'm I'm curious to hear your response to, to that stat, that the number increased. And this was, by the way, community-wide. This wasn't just Christians. Just people who said black pastors are the most important leaders within, you know, the black community. As a co-pastor at uh, Double Love Experience, uh, shout out to Dr. Gabby Wilkes in the building. Um, How do you think about that? First of all, thank you, dear brother. I appreciate that. Um, Secondly, I I think that the data feels entirely right, certainly comports with any kind of anecdotal experiences that I, I have had and perhaps that many of us have had. Um, I do wonder though, um, from a civic and political perspective, if black pastors deserve the trust that our people placed in them. Because we see black pastors doing everything from supporting people whose policies from infrastructure to schools to healthcare to environment do not serve us and do not reflect the sense that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, right? The people and all they they dwell therein. So sometimes black pastors serve as validators for political agendas that put black people in caskets too quickly. Not because it's God's will, but because the will of legislators and court decisions has sent us to an early cemetery that God didn't ordain for us, but that somebody legislated for us. So some of the taken for granted trust that black pastors have, I think becomes truly earned when we have a more polycentric view of the black church alongside community centers, the black church alongside your NAACPs, alongside your movement for black lives. And at its best, I think you see a lot of black churches doing that. So I'm not suggesting this isn't happening, but I think that's what a robust uh, kind of trust looks like when black pastors are in community rather than trying to lead the parade alone. Yeah, that's a lot there. And by the way, if you're enjoying this, uh, you get to be part of the conversation. Uh, There's gonna be a QR code where you uh, can put in questions and, and we'll continue the convo going in just a little bit. Like, this is like a little 10 minute, you know, heads up for when we transition to when you get to be the facilitator. Um, one of the things that I want to turn back to is this issue. Some researchers have kind of connected this idea of spiritual but not religious with uh, distrust of institutions. And this idea that, you know, if I think about religious practice, many people think about observances that are oftentimes facilitated by institutional leaders. Um, and, this, and this lack of trust in institutions goes way beyond the church, right? Whether it's government, I mean, it's at all time low with media, all these types of things. I'm curious about what's your take on that reality of just suspicion of institutions and how that plays into this conversation. Go ahead, Don. Uh, people are suspicious and untrue untrusting of institutions because institutions have shown themselves to be untrustworthy. Um, you know, you, you have to acknowledge the massive amount of legalism. Like there's this beautiful vision for what it means for us to be with God. And that is not what people see in the church. They see legalism, abuse of so many different kinds, a lack of accountability that who our scriptures say we're to be, that's not who you are. You're telling me I need to be something, but that, I know what you're doing. Um, after you get out of here, or what is not people not being held accountable for their behavior. And so people have, uh, uh, they've experienced trauma uh, and pain from a place that's supposed to be a place of hope and love. And so they still want the Lord. They still want Jesus. They just don't want the place that they met Jesus at. Um, And so I see people trying to wrestle with, like, I'm calling myself spiritual because I want to hold on, but I can't be there because I have too much pain from that place. And we've got to acknowledge the ways in which the church has not been the church. Part of people's response is because of how we've shown up. And we got to own that. Okay. Amen. So like, let's say we own it. Then what? How do we, what do, we do about that? <laughs> I think that, um, you know, this is a really great question. How do you get institutional distrust? 
I think you get institutional distrust because for the first time, a lot of these houses are being tested by storms. And you know, too many people jumped into the trend to go to seminary. They were planted by some board and they were installed as pastors with no evidence of being able to properly shepherd and love somebody without pay. Without what but now? You can do without, that without money, money without pay. I, I thought you said without petty. No, without, no, I said without pay. pay. Let me, I'll say it again. But you can do that without Hold on, let me, right? let me finish. Too many people signed up for a seminary, were ordained by some type of board, and then became installed as the highest spiritual leader over God's people with no evidence that they could do it without being paid. And so we built an entire nation on many disqualified people who were now supposed to be the spiritual head of God's church. And listen to this. Anybody can look good with ain't no rain going. But the word says that the house that's tested by the storm, whatever the foundation is, is going to be revealed. And so anybody can talk a big game. What did Mike Tyson say? Everybody got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I think that the reason why people distrust it or are starting to distrust institutions is because when they really needed them, 81% voted for a certain candidate. When they really needed them, it felt like if I don't go here, that I don't count. When they really needed them, and people like myself who work in the marketplace, well, if you are not intricately involved, then we don't really understand. And I think that the distrust comes from not being able to connect your everyday life and healing to a relationship. Okay. Right? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, go ahead. So, I don't think, I think that could be, that could happen with or without seminary. I think being placed in a place and not being appropriately prepared. So, I don't want it to... I don't want that to be the only thing we hear. You went to seminary. Sure. No, you could not go to seminary. People skip seminary now. Yeah, and, now. and the same thing could happen. Um, but I also think there is something, not just about people being um, inappropriately, misappropriately placed. I think there's something, too, about people being lured um, by certain people, groups, or opportunities, or not being Charisma. broke. Shoot, let me tell you. Um, Okay, eating will really get you to think some things, right? Uh, you want to be hungry? No? Well, come on over here, right? We have to remember that if you want to start at seminary, seminary uh, MDiv is only comparable to a law degree with one difference of an extra field ed experience. Uh, but when you go and get all those student loans and you get out, my friend's shaking his head, he knows you're going to get out. You're not getting paid like an attorney. And you might never get paid like an attorney. And so there are a lot of things that can lure you when you're hungry and broke and paying back a whole lot of student loans. And if we're honest about where we are today, this type of mistrust with people who did not support us, like you're saying, Andrew, when they should have and they're going and supporting policies that they don't even believe in, policies that wouldn't even help them, a lot of that is the funding behind it. Because Amen. these are not people who are randomly getting offering. Offering ain't doing that. Large organizations who are promising you platform and prosperity that does not come from tithes and offering does that. And so you can't help but trust, uh, not trust, a church that is a puppet for organizations certain, supporting certain policies right. and politics. You can't help because that's not your pastor. Your pastor is the leader of that organization. Okay, so earlier when I asked, Woo. what do you do about that? When, uh, you know, Dr. Ms. Wilson was explaining this reality of distrust of institutions, and you mentioned create a space for healing. Yeah. Ex just expound on that mm -hmm. a little bit. I mean, we have to create space for healing, and this is not how we talk about it, but first at the top. 
that you can go with other people who you can say, you know, um, have held the same position as you, you know, your peers, and you can go and repent for what you've done, be honest about how you got there. I was hungry. <laughs> You know, my wife said, no, I didn't sit through three years of an MDiv and come out like this. We can't buy a house. We can't get a decent car. Our kids can't go to decent schools. We ain't had a vacation in 1992. You know, like, be honest and repent. Talk about how you really got there, where you want to go. And we have to be honest and say there have, there, we have to get to the place where there are other ways to sustain a church financially other than tithes and offering. Because I don't care how much you repent. If you went because you're hungry, you're going back because you're hungry. All right. Other aspects. Of this I, First, do you kind of also resonate with this idea that the healing of, of woundedness from these institutions oftentimes takes place? And if so, how do we help people move forward, you know, with seeing, you know, the house of God as a place of refuge? It's a really great question. Um, Every Sunday at, at our church, we talk about um, the importance of uh, personal health, mental health, and, and public health. And I think a part of the distrust for churches, not all of it, but a part of it is, is not necessarily because the church is distrusted, but it's because we live in an environment that understandably produces a lot of distrust. There's not much to trust about how the Federal Reserve Bank sets its monetary policies. There's certainly not much to trust about how Congress can't pass any policies worthwhile. And we can walk that thing all the way down from the federal to the state, to the local, to the county government, dog catcher, so on and so forth. And so the, the question is, how can the church exhibit um, a certain kind of saltiness? How can it be light in the world in such a way that it can generate and evoke the kind of trust we need in an environment that rightly creates deep suspicion, deep distrust. I think a part of what that looks like is healing. I think another part of what it looks like is creating spaces like this of deliberation where we can get down to some of the root causes and determinants of why there's distrust in, in the first place. So I think it's really important to see critical thinking and come let us reason together as a critical part of how we can collectively find the way together rather than the solution kind of being imposed. I was so confused. I remember, like, God, I don't know what to believe. I don't know if I should believe this book. I don't know if you can be trusted. This is the book and the foundation that my whole life is built on. Can I really trust it? Well, this is a little story all about how my life got twist, turned upside down. My professor said, I'm gonna change everything you thought you knew about Jesus. And that was the first clue and the first indicator that this was not gonna be the easy A that I anticipated. As I got immersed in apologetics, I didn't see anyone like me. And I thought, man, it would be great to have this material contextualized for my people. I founded Jew3 Project to help people know what they believe and why because I know what it feels like to question your faith and feel like you don't know where to turn. See, I believe a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Deconstruction is a part of you really being able to understand your faith. And that's the theme of this year's conference, Courageous Conversations 2023. Renewed faith moving from deconstruction to reconstruction. I challenge you to meet us in Washington, D.C., August 31st to September 2nd. Register today at CourageousCombos.org. Now, you know, I think we appropriately have spent a lot of time looking at the reasons why people have, you know, maybe chosen this identity of spiritual versus religious. I would like with the, you know, a little bit of time we have, so maybe a lightning round for us. I'm going to just throw something out there and you just, because I actually think that to a degree, there's a bit of a smokescreen happening when someone says I'm spiritual but not religious because essentially, regardless of if you're, there's nothing in the definition of religion that makes it that there has to be some centralized place of authority that tells you to do something, right? If somebody doing yoga, they doing meditation, that's a essentially a religious practice is based on what you believe. To what degree is maybe going to the spiritual but not religious well kind of maybe chasing relief from a broken cistern? Say the question again. Yeah, to what extent is maybe this identity or the, the you know, people, we've already explained why 
that attraction is there, right? The, because of the distrust of institutions. But I just wanna kind of just focus a little bit on that as a concept and go, to what degree is the spiritual but not religious identity itself somewhat flawed? So if it's based off of rules, then that's the problem. You ever heard the phrase, rules without relationship leads to rebellion? I think that some of the, um, the thoughts is, you know, when we were growing up, we would say, are you going to hell, you going to heaven, right? So if you want to stand up, you sit down, you going to hell, you stand up, you going to heaven. That's when you get baptized, right? Well, that type of motivation for a young person, an adult, anything, all it drives is fear, not love. Okay. So it's lightning I, around, so I want to Yeah, I'm, sure I'm going to okay. get right to it. I think until people see that there's freedom in following God, they'll never choose freedom. to do so. So it's freedom. Good. Last word. Uh, what it means to worship the God that you say you're in relationship with. And so I think there's parts of spirituality where I'm choosing what that looks like, or am I doing what he has called me to do? Mm. And so if I'm doing what he's called me to do, I might not want to be part of this place of toxicity, but maybe there is a place I need to be a part of. And so I think uh, spirituality allows us to sit in our individualism and have it be unchecked. Uh, and sometimes there ne it needs to be checked. Okay. Anybody else want to jump on? One thing I'd say, uh, just to take the question from a slightly different angle, I think it's important in a pluralistic society to exhibit a Christian identity that can exist in a multi-religious context and not to be threatened. And in fact, to have positive things to say, I'll give a super quick example. One of the things that I appreciate from an ethical and aesthetic perspective in hip hop is hearing all the deep and rich music that comes from Islamic traditions. Most Def, Lupe Fiasco, I think of Jay Electronica and Jay-Z. Um, so, so one can lean into that and not feel like you have to, you know, bring a Bible verse to explain why you enjoy it or why you appreciate it. So I think when we can have a spirituality that sits within multiple religious traditions, appreciates them while still having a rich, unthreatened, un, uh, non-hostile identity, I think that makes the witness more compelling and more irresistible rather than coercive. I just think, too, the freedom in finding. Like, you know, we forget that there are many spaces. And just because you don't find that in one space doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean everything should be thrown out. Like, you know, people are miserable at the church. Like, well, girl, why you still there? God ain't told me to left. Did you ask God? Did you sit and ask? Did you say you were miserable and you want to find someplace else? I think we act like we are just like tethered to one miserable space when there is a freedom in finding the place where you belong. All right. Well, that's a, can we give it up for our panelists for, you know, just going back and forth. This was a very energetic, energetic exchange. And now we get to uh, hear from you and some of your questions. So one of the top questions we have is, can you address non-Christian spiritual practices such as crystals, burning sage, and manifesting that seem to be embraced by spiritual Christians? I'm out. Go, Andrew. Listen, they done got me before in them comments. I'm done. Well, uh, from, so uh, two things. One, I, I have not necessarily um, lit a crystal or burnt sage. However, I think as a religion that has inherently deep affinity for sensuality in the flesh, we are a religion of the incarnation. We're a religion that talks about bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't think there's any solid doctrinal reason to be offended by sage being burned and by crystals insofar as our deep experience of what's in, I'm going to make a relatively traditional argument, our deep appreciation of what's in creation ought to lead us to have a deeper appreciation for the creator. All right. Anybody else want to jump Babe, on that? We don't want that smoke. You know Andrew Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that smoke. Uh, oh. <laughs> we'll continue. Um, how would you respond to Christianity is not a religion, but a relationship? That, that idea. So for, you know, we've been talking about spiritual, but not religious. So how do you, you know, there are those who might think that they transcend this dialogue by saying, well, Christianity is a relationship and not a religion. I think it is. I think it is a relationship. Jay-Z talked about how he um, saw the abuse of one of his family members from a pastor in their family, and it led him to not believe in Christianity. So I think it is a relationship. Whoever's relationship you have, you're observing what it means to follow this thing, maybe at the higher or lower level, and then you in invoke that thing. And I think that our job now 
is to help people come into a healthier relationship with people who are wrestling with tensions. I love that you talked about having a non-hostile faith that can exist pluralistically because now I'm not threatened by you know, different beliefs, different understandings because I'm grounded in the truth. So I think the relationship means you have to have a clear sense of identity, a clear, uh, the ability to, um, to serve someone else and the ability to be able to just listen and to learn, to know that all truth is God's truth. And you're not singularly understanding one thing, but all of us are able to learn from one another. I think there's an element to which uh, I had a friend remind me and tell me, do not judge a philosophy by its abusers. And so I think that we That's often good. judge religion by people who abuse religion. Because I think religion and relationship go one hand in hand because what constitutes my relationship? How do I foster that relationship? What are the boundaries of my relationship? Uh, and so religion gives us the guidance to be able to, because the goal is relationship. The goal is I foster this relationship with God and these habits and practices and beliefs help me get there. Um, but I think we see the, the abuse of religion and then say, no, I don't want that. I want the relationship. Right. I, yeah. And I think that's an important point because I wonder, you know, I used to say that all the time. And then I guess I started to think and realize, I don't know how this is landing on someone who's like not believing at all. It's like almost like absurd. Like, but you're religious though. Like, but you do religious things. Like you go to church and you read your Bible. Like, and so I, I wonder to what extent is the connotation of religiosity, something that that's kind of a, a dodge away from if we just understand religious practice as basic as anything that you do to connect with the divine, regardless if that comes from an institution or not. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of, you know, that's, all right, but let, we'll move on. How should Christians slash the church respond to the growth of African spirituality and black Hebrew Israelites and their influence on black Christians. Well, as uh, folks like the uh, Jew 3 Project have illustrated, when we talk about the growth of African spirituality, in at least the first instance, we're talking about the growth of Christianity in some respects, right? Because Christianity has such deep roots on, on the continent, uh, particularly when we think of Ethiopian Coptic churches and, and, and others we could point to. But, but I think there's also something that is deeply ancestral about biblical faith uh, that you see from the genealogies that you see from Paul talking about uh, his grandmother, talking to Timothy about his grandmothers having uh, shaped his faith, right? Shout out to Dr. Yolanda Pierce talking about uh, how grandmother's faith often shapes our faith. And so I think that's important to note because I think culturally throughout African diasporic religious traditions, there's a deep ancestral link. And I, I would rather, maybe this is ironic of me, but I, I feel like we should accent the things that are positive and make the kind of Christ of culture move rather than uh, the dissonant move. Yeah, I agree. I also have to, when I think about African spirituality, of course, right, I think first, like, that's not far from us, right, like, Christ, because of where Christianity started. But I also, I think sometimes we hate things because we don't want to study enough, we're too afraid to dip into a pool, to hear what someone else has to say. And so we're just like, you know, we say silly things like, uh-uh, not me, I'm covered by the blood. Well, what are we talking about right now? <laughs> like they might believe in the blood too. What is this actual conversation? And so I wouldn't throw out all African spirituality to think that it's completely different than who we are. Um, but I also think we should be, we should have an intellectual security and we should have a faith security and a relationship security, like with mm -hmm. God, sure. enough to be able to hear someone out, enough to be able to study something else, enough to be able yeah. to dip into another pond and say, I see why they're there. I see yeah. how they got here. This came from roots in the black church. I see why it feels good and secure because you do not win a black man from Christianity right. to, Hebrew, to become a Hebrew, black Hebrew Israelite without first making a Christian connection. Right. That's where it comes from. Right. So they use it to win you over, and we can't even learn enough about them to understand why they are, to make an attempt to bring them back or to be able to dwell together or have a conversation. And so I really think Christians become lazy when we, and not the person asking the question, because I think it's a very appropriate question, but I think it's very lazy for us to say, African spirituality, what you think about it? Right. Well, let me, let me, let me try to help, because, you know, that was, that was uh, ironic. 
That was great. Uh, in terms of a, a, an approach, a posture that is not antagonistic. And yet at the same time, I think, and I think it does from an important apologetic standpoint, help us remember what was it, John Mbisi said that, you know, Christianity has been in Africa so long, it can be considered an indigenous African religion. And in its actual practice, you know, it's older in the ways that many people practice Yoruba at this point. So like, that's a thing. And yet at the same time, I think what this question is really trying to get at is uh, certain beliefs in practices that set themselves either up against or that are being viewed as, as a alternative to a historic Christian belief, right? So in that sense, if someone is being drawn to an idea of spirituality that is very self-referentially in opposition to or a distinction from a sense of Christianity, how, how would you think about engaging you know, it, with that, if, you know, is that something that's just like, oh, you know, you spiritual, I'm spiritual, that's cool. Or is there a sense of an apologetic, uh, you know, impetus to wanting to, you know, uh, maybe help them see some sort of a, a, a historic African origin to their Christian faith? Let me weigh in on something, because you can never just talk about something in its current form. You always have to talk about its historical context. One of the things we have to acknowledge is that this is the first time since the transatlantic slave trade that black people in America have had the ability to pause long enough from their labor to consider their origins, right? And I think that some of the desire that we have, again, you see Marcus Garvey, like you've always seen it. Like people are like, we gotta go back to Africa, this is the way. I think that what we're longing for, what people are asking is, what's my connection to Africa? And so I don't think the African spirituality thing is the, man, I'm just longing for this religion. I think that as we are considering who we are, and my last name is Thompson, and I'm looking and I'm going, that's like Scottish. And then we get these ancestral tests, <laughs> and I'll never forget this. You know, I would have never took them because, you know, they said it was taking the DNA and shipping it over, right? <laughs> but somebody in my family took it. <laughs> and I will never forget one day walking into the bathroom, looking in the mirror and thinking, I'm Nigerian. That was the first time in my entire life that I looked in the mirror and identified myself with a specific area, tribe in Africa. And so I just think that some of what we can do to address these things, what I do is, is to take people back to Africa. I'm saying, oh, you longing for Africa? All right, let's take you on a trip. Let's take you to Ghana. Let's take you to Uganda. Let's take you to Zimbabwe. Let's take you to these places, Nigeria, Ethiopia, because there's clearly a longing for you to be back to understand who you are, your origins, your root, your historical story that is preceded before slavery. So what I'm hearing you kind of advocate for is, again, this kind of ethical, kind of embodied engagement where we don't just necessarily challenge the epistemological concern of these specific truth statements that someone may decide to reject or accept, but that we also kind of try to engage with some of the, what's underneath the surface that is drawing, you know, to that even attraction in the first place, right? That's the big, that's what, what do y'all think Black Panther was about? The movie Black Panther was about two people look the same, one is from the motherland, one is from Oakland. LA, Oakland, and he gets there and he says, I'm one of y'all. And everybody is shocked. And I think that we are, whether we know it or not, we are longing to know who we are authentically to where we come from in, the, in Africa. That is a deep, deep sense of the identity that is being kind of searched for and pursued. So let me ask, this is a um, great follow-up to that. Uh, someone asked, why should we be Christians if I'm kind, of, if I'm kind and universally benevolent towards others and fight for justice, why does it matter if my beliefs about God are correct, especially when many Christians are cruel and unjust? I feel like there's somewhat of a connection between those thoughts. Any responses to that? To be honest, 
Um, I'm selfish to a certain extent. Um, I don't want to hear this back to me, okay, because I won't be happy. Um, but I'm not the person who want to do all those things and be a lot like God and not have access to the promises of God and the blessings of God and all the thing that comes along. See, there is a behavioral expectation, right? There's a belief um, that comes along. There's something I want to be, I have a desire to be closer to, right? So I don't want to be... Um, like God or do the things of God and then not be able to talk to God, not be able to have the peace of God, not being able to have answers from God. So it's the all the other stuff, all these things, right, that I want access to and not just to be good. See, it's good for me to be good. I understand that. But I'm good and I know <laughs> that there is something else in addition to being good. I am good and I am faithful and I serve and I can talk to God like I have no sense when the world around me seems to be chaotic and I can walk away sometimes with a sense of peace or at least go to a certain community. It's the other stuff that I don't want to let go. I'm not even going to go heaven or hell. I'm going to say that there are things that I get from day to day, there are new mercies I get to see. There is a relationship that I am cultivating. There is a loneliness I don't have to experience even while I'm being good. And those things, I'm not giving up on. For, for me, what has remained, and I believe will always remain, so profound about Christianity is that it, it gives us multiple streams and traditions in which to to love and to experience love. So there's not only love of neighbor, love of self, love of God, uh, but there's also love of stranger, love of ourselves when we're estranged from ourselves or from different parts of our community. And there's also the emphasis on um, loving one's enemy. And I think that's a distinctive part. Uh, it's not, arguably, it's not unique to Christianity, but the way that we see it embodied in Christ, I think is so compelling, so captivating, and I think it creates the possibility of communion uh, in society that has been disfigured by uh, so many attempts to abuse love and things of that sort. Okay, let me try to maybe put this in a different way, because um, I, 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 I want to try to dig to the heart of this. Like, almost the question seems to be, again, going back to the epistemological or ideas and ethical, you know, two sides. If I'm ethical, why does it matter what I believe epistemologically? So let me put it this way, maybe. Are ethics related to what I believe? Can I, is it possible for my sense of ethics to be unrelated to my sense of how I understand about myself and my relationship to my neighbor or to the divine? Or is it possible that maybe if I draw into certain doctrines, you know, that tell me that a certain other group of people are innately evil, and that they're going to be under my foot, you know, on judgment day, that that might impact my ethical treatment of them. So let me just throw that out. Like, do, do ethics do matter or relate or spring from epistemology, or can they be just two separate things that don't really relate to each other? I believe your ethics are going to arise from a place of... Uh, knowledge about who you are, the world you live in, whether that is Christianity or something else, that we are shaped by the culture and environment that we live in. And so what I believe is ethical is going to be shaped by that. And for the Christian, this ethic that comes from God, this, this holistic dynamic of, and, it, and I want to address that, that point in the question where Christians are unjust and cruel. Um, and so to separate what Christians do from what it means to follow God. Um, because God himself, uh, the ultimate standard for justice, calls us to be people of justice. And so some people might not be doing what they're supposed to be doing, but God himself, that's not part of what he's calling for us to be. Like it's this world, the vision we have in scripture is for a world set right. And so it's this holistic being and how I'm supposed to show up in the world. And that includes justice, but includes the things that Dr. Parker was talking about too. And I believe for the Christian, our ethics start with this place of knowledge of who God is. But you can have ethics without uh, coming from God. They come from how you have been shaped uh, in the world you live in. And we know that because people have ethics based on their pastor and their church and not based on the faith. Like, you know, depending on which church you go into, I mean, some, like sometimes, you know, their ethics is okay to lock kids up in cages, right? Um, and that's acceptable. That's not coming from the faith. That's not coming from God. That's not about Christianity. That's what you heard in the one place that you worshiped in. And I think we really pretend like that's not true. Mm. 
you know, we really do believe like, well, I mean, we know we believe everybody. Certain times we believe, hey, everybody believes this. Don't you believe it? And you're like, no, I don't believe it because you're saving. You're not going to heaven. You know what I mean? As opposed to this is how we worked it out. This is what's true in my community. This is what has been raised as truth or elevated as mm. ethical in my community. Yeah. But it's not true for the entire faith. You know, uh, BJ mentioned before the importance of history, right? Um, you know, I've, you know, was once told that it's important for us to know that the document or the, the scripture that we have is the Bible is, especially when we look in the Old Testament in the prophetic tradition, the minority report. It's the version critiquing the practices of the majority religious institution community structure. Andrew, how do you think that understanding the historical even trajectory of the tradition itself might help someone understand what to do about the fact that they are, as they put it, many Christians who are cruel and unjust? Yeah, I think we have to take seriously the fact that so much of what we get as uh, the Bible comes as the minority r report, as you're mentioning, under the, the backside of Assyrian Empire, Babylonian Empire, Persian Empire. That in some cases, uh, we see the Bible as, as a kind of prison literature, right? When we think of Paul's letters and, and other things that we might point to. So I think at the, the heart um, and at its best moments, I think we see Scripture teaching us to uh, not only do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, but I think you see... Um, folks in, uh, in Israel struggling with what it means to incorporate folks in their midst and not always getting it right uh, when it relates to questions of intermarriage, when it relates to questions of being hospitable and kind to those who may not share your language, who may not share your heritage, who may invoke God differently. And, and I think it's also important, uh, Lutherans draw a distinction between Christ as uh, the living word and the Bible as uh, the written or, or documented word. I, I, I want to draw uh, e even though it's the case that uh, we know of Christ predominantly through the scriptures, so I want to acknowledge that kind of hermeneutical circle. But I say that because I think it's important to distinguish between the Christ who we experience at the word of God and what we see in the text, which is uneven in some places. Yeah. Um, well, I just, you know, if I, if y'all don't mind, I'd like to answer the question too every once in a while. I mean, I've been, I know I'm so surrounded us, by so all these. Us, uh, how would you respond to such a question? <laughs> I mean, to the why should we be Christians, I, my first reaction, because it's true, like, I mean, like my testimony, I came from a different tradition. I was born Muslim. That's where my name comes from. Rasul is Arabic. And what I found was that, you know, there was a, a quote that C.S. Lewis once said, I'm going to kind of butcher it, but he said something to the effect of, I believe in Christianity, like for the same reason I believe in the sun, not because I can see it, but because by, I can see all things through it, right? Like, in other words, it gives me insight and understanding and depth of connection. It coheres with my understanding of reality more than any other thing. And then on top of it, and the main thing for me in that reality, not to try to make it sound super intellectual, was the reality that I was a sinner in need of a savior. Like, that was like the main thing for me. Like, it was like, I thought I, I was a self-righteous secular person that I just thought I'm good enough by myself. And then I fell flat on my face and realized that wasn't true and realized the truth and the utter kind of centrality of the cross was that there was a God who died for me and invited me into salvation. And I believe that's true. And so it, the, the benefits of that for me is that it happens to empower my ethics. It empowers my understanding of what it means to love my neighbor and to love my enemy. Um, but you know, I just wanted to throw that in there just before Thank we continue so on. Thank you so much for that. You know. <laughs> I was just being you. I appreciate it. I saw what you was doing there. We flipped, we flipped roles for a second. Moving right along. Okay, next top uh, highlight. Does being spiritual versus religious seem to be a battle between young believers versus old believers? I knew you would be wanting to talk about this. When we did State of the Black Church study, one thing I kept putting in the margins, and forgive me, I know people won't love to hear this, I kept saying, who pissed off boomers? Say that again. Who pissed off boomers? Like, when I was doing State of the Black Church, I was like, shoot, I should have opened Black Boomer Cafe. Um, <laughs> older generations are not most pleased with the circumstances. They're just most committed in spite of the circumstances. Boomers in a number of places were most displeased, but they stay and they still serve. 
You know, they hold their money when they're mad, though. <laughs> but they keep up that seat, right? <laughs> I'm gonna sit here and not give no money. <laughs> um, <laughs> So they don't talk about it the same. They don't always share it. They're not trying to. Um, they're not trying to win you over. Well, they will win you over to not voting for something, right? We know what that looks like. They'll parking lot talk you into not tithing or not supporting something that they don't like. But they just don't talk about their faith and down their faith in the ways sometimes or shy away from being religious in the ways that young people do. But they show it in other ways and they're not that happy. So I think maybe if the, the language wasn't so difficult for them or maybe if they were using this kind of language, they were younger, they may share in the same conversation and discourse. I don't think these, this is language that they're willing to use even if these are feelings that they have. Gotcha. So it might be more connection there and synergy than the research might on the surface shows. Absolutely. Let me uh, throw this one out. And uh, BJ, you've talked a lot about community in your you know, uh, fellowship, koinonia, as you said. Um, so this question asks, how did the pandemic and relegation to virtual worship services exacerbate the idea of the spiritual did, uh, did spirituality exceed discipleship during the pandemic? I want to kind of ex- broaden that out a bit to just kind of talk about, like, how did the habit of us not gathering together, right, yeah. impact us in ways that we might need to consider at this point in the process? Yeah, I think, again, history matters, right? I think we're in a place where the moment matters, but really history, how we got here, always matters. And a couple of things when you look back at the history of even the beginning of the world, the creation story, says that Adam saw that she did not die, therefore he ate, right? My interpretation on that account is that Adam saw that even though this was a rule, he could get away with it without experiencing any consequences or this word had no utility in his life, right? There was a, the generation before us came out of the 60s and they saw uprise, change, you see the, you see everything like social distress. Well, that came back together under faith institutions. So it was like utility, let's get back to church, let's focus on the family, let's do these things. I think that the pandemic in a very like, <laughs> I don't want to say divine way, but just a very like interesting way show people that they could miss church, not go, be in this, and still be just fine. And I want to say that loosely because I want to also respect and honor those who lost their lives in the pandemic. But I think that church lost its utility because institutionally means that sometimes you don't have to have the relationship with the people. Now, adversely, I mean, conversely, those who had relationships with their people stay. <laughs> the church did fine. But many of those who only had an institutional influence on their people lost it to the most popular online pastor. I won't say his name. And <laughs> they streamed him every week, not your pastor, right? So you were doing online service. Another pastor was getting all the streams for their service. And, and so I just say that I think that the pandemic showed oh, this is not a utility. If I don't have this, then I'll be just fine. And I think that's where we've changed. And so we're now having to, and I love what the pastor was saying earlier, now that people are still getting sick, having babies, dying, I think that the church, considering that the church as an institution or as a relationship or spirituality has a place, is something that people are having to think about again gotcha. because of those moments in life. How, what do you think about this kind of moment in context of the practice in the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I would agree. Those who had a church with deep connection and community amongst its members, they were fine. Um, and the churches that didn't have it weren't. Um, or they just saw their people say that me being in the place, um, and I think virtual church is a whole nother conversation, uh, but me being connected to this place of worship is not really that important. Um, And so what I also think it illustrated was a discipleship gap. 
uh, that people genuinely don't think that's valuable for me to be a part be committed to be showing up, even if it's in a Zoom meeting <laughs> or it's just watching being in these pews. And so it's just like, if people don't know why it's valuable in a season why it is really valuable, then what have we been doing informing our people? And I think the pandemic showed that there's a discipleship gap. Gotcha. Yeah. Let, yeah. Amen. Let's talk about that sense of discipleship and the importance of spiritual formation in the context of gathering and community and maybe it's an importance or relevance in, in light of the pandemic where many people found themselves out of the rhythms of gathering in the way that they did before. Like, do you feel like as a pastor that that's, um, yeah, how do you just, how does that whole reality land on you in terms of, you know, what you've seen up close and personal? Yeah, this is a really great question. And, you know, I'm sure people probably experience it differently. Um, a part of what I experience has been is that um, people are engaging in things other than the Sunday moment, sometimes more deeply than the Sunday moment. Um, folks gather for weekly prayer or for community um, gatherings, sometimes with a, a deeper kind of intensity. And, and granted, we're um, a newer church, um, so our experience may be distinct from other congregations. But, but I think that's important to lift up in response to your question, because the opportunities to show how there can be a sense of um, novelty, adventure, passion, and kind of religious things like prayer moments uh, around noon, I think is a really great opportunity to help people experience richness and community that can give them ex an experience of solitude and communion with God when they're with their families and when they're by themselves. I think that's a distinctive um, thing that churches can help instill in their people, and, and not only pastors to people, but sometimes uh, a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, right? People praying and huddling together among themselves, I think also helps to create a deeper sense of attachment and discipleship to the point that you, you rose. Yeah, I wanted to ask you this real quick um, because uh, some of the broader Bar Barner's research, I don't know how this might play in to a specific, you know, black context, kind of mentioned that, or this was actually in Pew's research, that Gen Z, so the generations after Gen X, were less likely to identify as spiritual but not religious than the previous generation was, which I thought was interesting, and more likely to identify as religious but not spiritual. It was stated like that, too. Same thing. Okay. What do you think that, how do you explain that? Now, the levels are different, right? White, white people believe at a higher rate, um, but I actually thought black people shouldn't even, I didn't want to put it on the survey. I was like, we don't need this. We don't. Uh, you know, identify as religious, not spiritual, like take that out. And they were like, no, can we? I'm like, okay, let's, let's see how many people don't believe like that in a black uh, church community. And they did. I think it was like a, around, it was under 11% for sure. Um, but it was something that was rising. And that's why when we talk about like rituals and practices and you talk about why they want to be buried, married and baptized, it's because culturally we're so connected to the black church that you can actually have rituals and practices that you want to do that come out of the black church that you don't even see as spiritual it's just necessary that's what my grandmama said we do you know like no this is what you do it's just like when you know you have a baby and you don't take that baby out until so and so so and so some black church practices are just as cultural as they are religious and so because they're so interconnected when they talk about um black people like losing faith or having an issue in Christianity, right, about we're losing Christians, like white people and white churches are always going to have a more difficult time. And they're always for a number of reasons, right? Their numbers are always higher. But with black people, even if you've never been in a church, there are some rituals and practices that you know that are familiar with you for us to at least be able to have an easier job luring you back like a come hither. Like you may not know it in scripture. You may not know anything about those three Hebrew boys, but you you do know that uh, your child should be baptized, whether dunked or sprinkled, get them in there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, gotcha. so they can live a long time. Whatever right. you think that yeah. means, you know, yeah. or why baptism is important or why, you know, uh-uh, baptize, I mean, marry me in the church. You know, I don't want one of them outside, with, mm. put me in the church, that's what my grandmama said, or ain't nobody asked us to bury them um, in a park, I mean, mm. to do their funeral in the park. They only want graveside services. They're like, mm-mm, put me in the church right. because 
these are rituals that we know to be culturally right. necessary. Mm -hmm. And this is also what gives us a hand up, leg up, whatever you want to talk, say, when it comes to evangelism. Mm. That mm. even if I don't know the songs of the church, because sometimes they don't, but guess what they do know? The hymns of the church that have been hummed around. Mm. Got it. And even if they're, you know, we learned that, like, you know, Generation X didn't always grow up in church either. Right. But even if they didn't know what was Kirk Franklin was singing, they knew that hymn that was lined. <laughs> and those kind of things are passed down enough for us to always have a toe in, even if not a foot in, to be able to bring you not back, but at least in. Well, thank you so much for reminding us the importance of rituals, you know, and the, the value that they have and even just framing our lives, the importance of definitions. When we say, when you hear spiritual versus religious, just even asking the follow-up question, what does that mean? The importance of community, you know what I mean? And, and just however we find that, whether that's, you know, in the building or outside of the building, and uh, the importance of the healing and really making space for people. Can we give it up for our panelists uh, as we go? Um, thank you so much for having us here and ready to move on to the next section. I was so confused. I remember like, God, I don't know what to believe. I don't know if I should believe this book. I don't know if you can be trusted. This is the book and the foundation that my whole life is built on. Can I really trust it? Well, this is a little story all about how my life got twist turned upside down. My professor said, I'm gonna change everything you thought you knew about Jesus. And that was the first clue and the first indicator that this was not gonna be the easy A that I anticipated. As I got immersed in apologetics, I didn't see anyone like me. And I thought, man, it would be great to have this material contextualized for my people. I founded Jew3 Project to help people know what they believe and why because I know what it feels like to question your faith and feel like you don't know where to turn. See, I believe a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Deconstruction is a part of you really being able to understand your faith. And that's the theme of this year's conference, Courageous Conversations 2023. Renewed faith moving from deconstruction to reconstruction. I challenge you to meet us in Washington, D.C., August 31st to September 2nd. Register today at CourageousCombos.org. <laughs>